So we want to add some sprinkles to our donut and obviously manually placing them by hand would be absolutely mad. Um, and the previous method, which would be to use particles, which is what I taught from my old donut tutorial series, uh, that's glitchy, it's outdated, and thank goodness we don't have to touch it because there is a new and better, new, amazing geometry nodes, geometry nodes, which uh, in the name kind of tells you a little bit about what it does, uh, similar to what we just covered, uh, nodes, uh, similar to material nodes, geometry nodes lets you combine things, take this value, put it into that value, and then create new things, but for geometry, as in the actual mesh, the objects that are going on in your scene. Um, it's really, really powerful. It's almost hard to overstate uh, just how powerful it is. Um, because for example, you could make a building one building that has controls for the size of the building that changes depending on the number of floors it has. And then you've got like infinite variations. Uh, or you could create a geometry node system for power poles, right? So that they dynamically link together. And then when they get close to a building, it like attaches it there. Or you could make icicles dynamically appear on objects the closer they get together. Uh, not to mention all the crazy stuff that it enables for animation and motion graphics. And that's just getting started. Like this feature was only introduced very recently and uh, it's already enabling so much. Um, by the way, speaking of which, brief pause for all of my uh, fellow Blender users who learned geometry nodes when it was first introduced about eight months ago for 2.92. Most of that's kind of redundant now because <laughs> they have updated geometry nodes to a new fields-based system and it's much easier to use. Don't get me wrong, it was the right decision, but it's surprising that it happened so soon after they just first introduced it. So I did a tutorial on it and now that tutorial is kind of outdated. Shame for me. Um, but anyways, I'm gonna show you the uh, the new method. It is easier for everyone to use and it's, uh, it's good that they did it. Um, but anyways, let's get to it. So you wanna obviously select the object you wanna have the sprinkles uh, scattered on, which is our icing. And to access geometry nodes, you could do it a couple of ways. Uh, one would be to split your view and then change this new view to the geometry node editor. Um, but I instead prefer to create a workspace for it. So if you click the, because uh, there's not one here by default, uh, if you click the little plus icon, then go general, uh, there is one that you can enable called geometry nodes. So click that. And now we've got this extra one at the top there for geometry nodes. And I'm going to move this over. Oh, you can't actually move it over. Yeah, how about that? I just assumed that you could. I don't think I've ever tried to do that in Blender. All right. Well, it's over on the right-hand side. I know where it is. Um, and uh, you can see it's, it's split and arranged our windows. I don't want this one at the top here. This is like a spreadsheet for your vertices and stuff going on in the scene. A bit too advanced, more advanced than what we need it for. So I'm just going to uh, merge it across, which again, you do by going to the top left-hand corner, click and drag across until it merges. Okay, so there's this big part at the bottom here. This is our geometry nodes editor. You wanna click on new. Aha. So when you do this, you will notice that yes, we've now got a node editor here to play with, um, but also in the right-hand side on the modifier stack, you can see that we've got this new modifier here for geometry nodes. So in order to use geometry nodes, it has to be a modifier. And it, you will only see what is displayed here in your geometry nodes on the selected modifier. So you can see there's a faint outline around this modifier. If I was to click off this and click on the subdivision right there, this has disappeared. Okay, so that's, if you've ever lost the geometry nodes, you're like, how do I, what happened? It used to be, it just click the modifier. If you click the little pin button, that will ensure that it will always be there. So if you click off it, it doesn't matter. So if you've only, if you've only got one system, I usually just click the little pin icon and it just makes it easier. Anyways, so similar to our shader, right? It works uh, left to right. Um, but, what, whoop, but what is interesting in this case is that we've got an input, okay? We've got the geometry and then that is being fed over to uh, the right-hand side to the geometry output, okay? The reason for that is that we've got mesh to start with. We've got all of this mesh info. So it's saying, take this geometry data and then put that out over here. And then that is gonna be the resulting mesh. So whatever we put in this middle section here is gonna result in the output mesh. As a very, very basic example, um, let's, I'm just gonna type in, I can't actually remember. There's so many nodes, it's hard to remember where they are, but I'll just say set position. So I'll put this in here and then let's offset this by five centimeters. Okay, so I have taken my icing, 
which is still there. The mesh, the original mesh data is what it started with. And then it changed its position, moved it up five centimeters, and now it's output it there, okay? So, I mean, I could animate this value. I could make this value be driven by something else. You can see how the possibilities, maybe. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, right, so that's, that's the example. So we want to scatter something over our, um, over our mesh. And if you hit Shift A, or just go to Add, you'll see a whole string of different things here. And look, learning them one by one, I think that's the wrong way to learn things, in my opinion. I think it's best to follow tutorials, see what, what it is you're trying to do, and then just pick up the nodes as you go. And you'll eventually have learned so much. That it's, it's like you've learned them one by one, but you'll have actually got some context for where it's actually used. So the one that you're looking for in this case is underneath point, distribute points on faces. Okay, so if I select that and I drop this in right here, um, you, depending on what you've got, because you might actually see like a big point, a big dot appearing. Um, but if you don't, in this case, we've got zero. It is actually creating points on our icing, but the density is so low for the scale of our donut that we're not seeing it. If I increased my density, I would see we've got points. Now, the reason these points are so ginormous is that we're working on a 10 centimeter scale for our donut. And so it's created really, really large points. I would hope at some point in the future, Blender has a uh, display option for how big those points are. But for now, it does not. You could change it with an extra node, but look, we don't need to because we're going we're gonna to add an object later on. But all this is to say is that it is actually there. Now, one thing you will notice is that our icing has actually disappeared. Okay, If you go into edit mode, it's still there. But in object mode, it is not. And that's because we said geometry input, convert it into points, and then that is going to be the geometry. We don't want that. We want our points and our geometry. So what you need to do is add in a geometry join geometry node. And you'll use that one all the time. We're going to take that, put that in there, and then take our output from our original mesh and then put that in there. So now we've got points as well as our original um, icing underneath it. Okay, so these points, as you can see, they're just blobs. And this is just a, a viewport representation of what it is. It's just like point, it's data that Blender is seeing. It's, it's little tiny things that do not exist. If you were to render it, you would not actually see anything. You just see your original donut because it's not using these points anywhere. So what we need to do is we need to, uh, well, first of all, we need to have an object for this to replace our points. So let's set our density to zero just so that we can actually not see those ginormous points blocking our view. And we wanna model the object that we want to be placed on our icing there, which is a sprinkle. And there's various types of sprinkles. We're gonna go for the most common one, which is based off a what shape? A cylinder. So shift A, I'm going to add in. This is a new object. So it's not in edit mode or anything like that. New object, cylinder. Now, when you do that, Again, scale of Blender, thinks we're working at like 10 meters scale or something. Uh, we can just turn that all the way down to its like absolute smallest size uh, to like down here and it's like almost the right size, but yeah. Um, and then uh, the vertice count, because, because this is gonna be scattered all of, o over our donut. You can see the number of like faces on there. It's quite a lot. It's very, that's a very detailed singular sprinkle. We don't need that much. So I'm gonna set that to instead eight. So now I've got that. Let's just move this, uh, move this to the side here. Move this up, and I'm just going to increase the scale of the x axis. Sorry, the z axis. So s z, just so that I can just roughly get about the size of the sprinkle, and I'll also just to scale it just s without any axes, just so that I can make it a little bit bigger. And that looks pretty good to me. Okay. So now with my icing here selected. I am going to, between here and here, where it joins in, we're going to create our, um, we, yeah, we, we're going to start referencing this new cylinder as our sprinkle. So you'd think it would be under points, but it's actually under instances. So instances, this is a word, yeah, it's just under instances. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> under instances. And there's two here that I always get them confused. Instances on points or instances to points. And the one we're looking for is instance on points. And I always get them confused. It's, 
I don't know. I think they, they got to come up with a different name for, to like delineate properly. Yeah, it, it's, I always click the wrong one. But we, we're creating points. And so therefore we want to put an instance, which is going to be an object that is like referenced fast. Like it can like stream it essentially without loading in the data a thousand times. Uh, that's what an instance is. Uh, and yeah, so we're putting that instance on our points. Okay, so we've got this node here. And now this instant, whatever we put in this instance is going to be our um, points, essentially. So if we were to actually select our cylinder up here in our outliner, and if we were to just drag this over to our geometry nodes thing, look what it does. It creates an object info node with our cylinder selected. Another way to access that would be underneath uh, input object info right there if you happen to lose it but that's a really short and easy way to just click drag it across and i've got it selected there and if i take the geometry from that and then put that into the instance of that we won't see anything because our density is set to uh, nothing basically now you can see something's happening we've got cylinders little tiny cylinders appearing on our icing now the, the cylinders are looking really short and stubby what's going on this comes back to that problem that if you watched the whole series from the start, you'll know that uh, when you scale and do things, and when I was scaling this, um, what it did was it changed the scale of this object here. And that's kind of, it's not been applied to the object data yet, essentially. So what you need to do first is hit Control A and then apply scale. And now it's actually referencing the object correctly. Okay. So. So far so good. Um, it is rotating it though the wrong way because it's rotating it um, yeah, upwards because that's how this cylinder looks. So I'm going to rotate this on the X axis. So R, X, and then you can see in the top left-hand corner, that'll actually give you the rotation amount. Um, and I want to go for exactly minus 90 degrees. Um, and you could, you could actually type it in by going hitting minus 90 and then you'll get that. Or another way is to just hold down control and then it will snap it to the nearest five degree increments. So that's a way that you can rotate something to an exact um, axis or an exact amount, basically. So now I've done that, nothing has changed because again, we've now changed the rotation here, but it hasn't really applied to the object. So I need to apply it, control A, rotation. Ha ha, okay, so now something's happening. I'm gonna increase the density here so that we can see more of our sprinkles, okay. Things are, getting better but you can see now we've got another problem where it's like it looks okay at the top but down here it's now jutting into it like that so that's because what we needed to do is to follow the rotation of these faces down here not use this blanket value across the whole thing but follow the rotation of the faces so um and this is where you know a lot of people find geometry nodes is very complicated and complex and it is it does kind of change your workflow from being like a canvas tool like an artist to kind of thinking more mathematically but what we've got here is distributing points so we're creating points and each of those points could have a rotation based on the face right so each of these individual points before them with their little like blotchy shapes they have a, a rotation applied to them so if we took that rotation from the face and put that into here which is our instances now it's actually matching the rotation of the face so it's kind of wrapping around it which is really cool it's what we want so let's increase our density here and you have to you have to use really high values here because we're working at such a small scale so this density value if you were making a let's say like a grass or something across here, right? like working at like two meters, right? Let's say, or like a human scale, right? You would need to use far, far less, you know, maybe 50, if you want like 50 scattered rocks across here. It's essentially, what is it? It's density per meter. And because we're working at like 10 centimeters, a 10th of that, it's like, we have to really crank this up to get, you know, if we want 90 sprinkles on our donut or something, I guess we have to go 9,000, something like that. Anyways, we just have to use really, really large amounts. All right, now, once you start adding, once you get to, yeah, let's go 50,000. We'll, we'll, I'll show you how to make this easy. I'm just doing it progressively so you can understand things. But yeah, let's go 50,000. You can see that, it, okay, it's cool. But like, okay, now our rotation looks silly because it's following it like it's made of straw. It's like all combed into it. Whereas really we want each of these points to individually rotate, still apply to the face, so they're not like jutting out crazy, but rotate around it. So between he here and here, this rotation value, we need to tweak. 
So again, you're not to know, or you'd never guess what node to use. It's one of those things you can only learn from tutorials. Um, but the node that we're looking for, Shift A, is underneath Utilities, and we're looking for Rotate Euler. Is that how you pronounce that word, Euler? Euler. Euler. Come on, no way. Euler. Wow. Euler. Euler? <laughs> Leonard Euler. All right, that is that is wow. That's why, all right, he's Swiss. Basil Swiss. All right, cool, man. Euler is how we're supposed to pronounce your name, but you're dead, so Euler is... <laughs> I'm going with Eula. It makes more sense to me. It's got an E and a U and an L and an ER. Eula. No, Euler. Euler. All right. So we drop this in here, making sure it's in the rotation, rotation. And uh, now it's it, we, we can tweak it. So if we hit rotate by and we just like, you know, rotate on one of these values here, you can see that we're rotating it on that specific axis. And look, we're getting some weird looking effects. Okay. The axis that we want to use is uh, the Z axis because we're looking top down. So hit the little Z thing up there. We want to rotate along this axis. Okay, so if we just increase this, you would see that we're rotating it, but it's not actually on the right axis, like something weird's going on. And that's because the by default base orientation is object, which I guess is the orientation of this object, but we want it to be local. And now it is local, I believe, to this sprinkle. That's my understanding of it. Whatever, could be wrong, but that's fine. Um, Cool, so that's good. Now, you can see that we're, we're rotating it, but it's on, they're all getting the exact same value. So we want to add basically randomness to this single value there. And the node for that, let me just move this up here so a little cleaner and easier to understand, is <clears throat> just type in search and it is random, random value. This is one you will use all the time because it is very, very common when you're making something, you wanna have random values for each new iteration or point or whatever. <clears throat> So this will generate a random value and there's a number of ways to do it. The default is float, which means just basically a single number and uh, it'll give you something between zero and one, okay? Now, if I was to take this and put this into here, you can see that um, it is working. It's rotating each of those points on its own individual axes. Um, but yeah, it, it's on all axes. So all the axes are getting a random value between zero and 30. And uh, it's not what we want. It's a little bit mashed up. So what we wanna do is change it from float to vector. So vector, and this is where some people go like, oh, geometry nodes, it's too complex. I get it. Like vector, right, what is a vector? It's basically, it's three axes, okay? Your X, your Y, and your Z, your X, your Y, and your Z. So it's just like this, zero to 30, but we've got it for each individual axis, which is exactly what we want. So if we were to put this into here, rotate by, now it's generating on zero to one, but we can say not the X and not the Y axis, just the Z axis. All right, so it's working. Each point is getting their own individual rotation. It's adhering to the uh, direction of the icing, but it's not fully rotated, right? Something's going on. That's because this value here. <clears throat> We need to increase this and you'd think like 360, right? Because 360 degrees. Um, and I was actually confused by this um, because it looks like, yeah, like it's, it's already rotating like way more than, you know, 360 <laughs> degrees. This is actually a radiant, like this, this is degree because it's got the little degree thing there. This is a radian value, which is, um, I guess like a single, it's like, Actually, I spoke to uh, Aaron Dale, who is a guy who really knows his geometry nodes, paid for some of his time to just ask him a load of questions. Um, but basically a radian, it's like uh, like pi, you know? In fact, if you type in pi, P-I, you'll get the value, 3.142. That'll give you 180 degrees because it's like half the circle. I This is where I like blanked out in math in class. I just like, all right, what do I need to do to like pass the test? <laughs> but, but he he evidently knows what he's talking about. It's double pi because it needs to be more than three, more than 100 and it needs to be 360. So it's double pi, I discovered, is tau, T-A-U. If you type that in, it's double pi. And uh, that's all the value you need. Like, so basically, I mean, you don't have to remember like to type in tau for the thing. It just, anything more than six will give you the correct thing because it just has to be more than 360. So that was all to explain that, um, yeah, basically why Oh gosh, how many times am I gonna try it? 
Yeah, that, that, I mean, that, that's all you need to know. <laughs> okay, so we've got a random value. Good. It's working. Things are working. Great. Cool. All right, the next thing to solve is how do we stop the sprinkles from appearing in places where they should not, right? Um, we don't want it on these globity, boot, globity bits, and we also don't want it underneath the icing, which is what's happening. It's putting it on both axes. So <clears throat> what we need to do is do something called a weight paint. Okay, so if we select our icing and then hit Control Tab, that brings up a pie menu here for the different modes. So we've already used edit mode, we've already used sculpt mode before, but there's one here, weight paint. Ha ha ha. Oh, I actually did it because I was <laughs> practicing for this tutorial, I've already done it. When you do weight paint, it will automatically add in a vertex group to it. So a vertex group is it's basically like a value of between zero and one for each individual point on your mesh. And you basically paint it in. Now it's covered in uh, sprinkles right now. So I'm gonna go to my modify stack. And uh, as we learned before, this little button here will disable a, a modifier from your viewport only. Um, and this one would disable it from your render, but yeah, just viewport, turn it off. Okay, so if I was to now just paint on here, whoops, by default, it would be this. Hey, why are you back again? Um, it's painting what looks like a heat map, okay? So the way this works in weight paint, blue, dark blue is a value of zero, red is a value of one, and then these other values are obviously leading up from there, like light blue, then green, then yellow, and then red to be all the way to one, okay? So we wanna paint, essentially, where do we want our sprinkles to go? Okay, so I'm gonna change the size, I'll change my, my weight paint, so that's Control F. Same hotkeys as before for uh, texture paint and uh, sculpting, F to change the size of your brush, and then Control F to change the uh, the weight in this case. All right, so I don't want it on those inner parts. I definitely don't want it down here, like that. So just where it could logically actually appear. And then the other thing I'll do, because this is where you sort of get a little bit artistic, but uh, yeah, you, you don't want to have like constant values anywhere. <laughs> so I'm just going to put use like single clicks to just say like no sprinkles here or less sprinkles, right? So I'm giving a, a lower strength value. Um, and then I'll just do a few little, it just makes it, yeah, it just makes your, what you're creating look more interesting when you've got something that is a little bit more unpredictable than um, what you would get normally. Okay, so once I finish white painting, hit control tab again, and then go back to object mode. You could also just do it up here, by the way. Okay, let's turn on our geometry nodes. So how do I get that reflected on my mesh? How do I use that vertex group, which by the way, we might as well rename it, sprinkles density. How do I use that in my density right here? Now I was yeah, asking Arendelle about this. I, I imagine at some point there would be a node that you could reference the weight paint group. At the moment, this is the only way to do it. We drag this value into this blank input down here of our group input, okay? Now what this does, this is actually a really, really handy thing, not just for this, but for anything. This is exposing a value. When we take something from here and we put it into one of these blank things, what it's also doing is it's putting that value over here in your modify stack. So now I've got access to that density value over here so that I don't have to jump to my geometry nodes if I wanna change the density of my sprinkles later on, I can just play with it right here um, without having to open up um, the full thing, right? Really, really handy. Um, next to it is a box, and this is the box that is important. It is the weight paint box, or the, the vertex group, or is it, maybe it's just any attribute. Anyways, you'll see that if I click that little thing, it changes from a number to a basically a text field, and then you can reference different attributes of the object. The one that we're looking for, of course, is the one that we have called sprinkles density. All right, now, when I did that, what exactly happened? Nothing. <laughs> and that is because it has assigned a value of zero to one, okay? Whereas previously, before, we were using values of 50,000. So I would need to convert my zero to one to a 50,000 thing, which I could do with a mm, math, math node, okay? So that was a utility, math. Set this to multiply and then put this in here. And then if I add it in 50,000, now I would get that only appearing where it needs to be. Ta-da, isn't that great? So, um, and then if I wanted to, I could also take this value and plug this in over here. And then now this controls 
my density, right? Um, it's like, it's my exposed density of this thing. Oh, and it's also, yeah, I guess it's got a maximum. I mean, this is the other thing, like we're, we're gonna change this <laughs> in a second um, because there's another problem that we've now got. Okay, so it looks cool, but how do we stop the clipping? Hmm, clipping. Each of these sprinkles is intersecting with other sprinkles. How on earth can we fix it? Well, we couldn't previously with particle nodes. We were just out of luck. We would have to just play with this seed value. The seed value, by the way, if you're not aware, it's like an, it's just a single value that it's, it's infinite variations. So if you don't like the orientation, the distribution, you could just hit this until you find something that you like. And that was my advice for the previous particle nodes. And it will still be my advice, but there is something that will help us right here. This is the first instance where we've got an advantage over uh, particles. It's... Uh, not just random distribution, but something called Poisson disk distribution. Poisson, there's no W in it, but <laughs> I was told that that's how you say it. I guess it's French. When we use this, okay, first of all, we've lost something, okay? Um, we've got some, some new, uh, so let's just talk about this a little bit. Okay, so we've got, um, by default, it'll be set to zero and the density max is probably set to, I think, 10. That's probably what yours is. But if we set this to 50,000, that is now identical to the random distribution, okay? So random Poisson disk density max is the exact same thing as your density value. What the what Poisson disk gives us as an addition is something called distance min. And the way this works is, is each of these points, right? So that's, that's a point right there. It's now, it's going to create a radius around it. So if I was to just increase this to something really small, cause this is meters. So we're working on like 10 centimeter scale. Um, it's going to create a radius around it. And then if there's a point inside that radius that's near this one, it's going to cancel that point. So it's going to delete that point. And then of course, obviously if I increase the size of my radius, it's now going to find more points and it's going to delete that point as well. So what I want to do is just keep increasing this until I'm using annotations. I right, turn that off uh, <laughs> um, until it starts to look plausible. Now, the thing is, is it's still not perfect because it doesn't know the rotation of these, these points. It doesn't know what this object size is. All it knows is that there is a point there and it's creating things. And it's, you know, canceling out that point, but sprinkles, obviously, if two of them are like side by side, it shouldn't be canceled out right? Because they're not intersecting, okay? Um, but it doesn't know the rotation of it. So really, the only way to fix this would be for Blender to have something called circle packing or some sort of packing algorithm. So it could read what the size of the objects are and then try to arrange them so that they're not intersecting. Currently, the, the two options we have with this method is to increase it to a really high amount so that even the two points couldn't touch each other end to end like that. But then it doesn't look realistic because the spacing is too big. So what I suggest is use something that is a little plausible, like you've still got them pretty close together and you won't, you'll get rid of most of the clipping this way, but then the seed value, you wanna change that until you got something that it's like there's not as much clipping. So my advice is still pretty similar to before, but at least it's better because we've got the, uh, the radius. So it'll detect most of the clips and it'll get rid of it, but you know, you wanna find something that will uh, not have as much intersection. But don't bother with that now because um, it's going to change as we do more things. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to, because I haven't, you can see we've still got the, we're not using the weight paint group anymore. So when you're using, if you're just using random, you would use this, the weight paint group, which as you might remember is this. So it's using our vert. I hope this isn't too confusing. Sprinkles density vertex group. So if, if we wanted to use it in random mode, we would use that. But in Poisson disk, we want to instead put it into density factor, which is conveniently a value between zero and one. So we don't even need to do any multiplication or anything. It's now, this is our density. This is our weight paint group. So um, in fact, if we want to tidy this up, we could say weight paint. Okay. And then this one, we will say sprinkle density. Okay. And then sprinkle density is going to be driving our density max. So actually that's the, I actually like poison disc more because you get random. It just like puts it all into one thing and you have to do a bunch of nodes to mix it up. But Poisson disc will uh, give you these extra things. So it's, it's much, a lot nicer. Um, cool. Let's clean this up a little bit better, actually. Sprinkle density. Now here's something else. We, we've got this density factor. Now 
you know, around 50,000 is what we want, but that's like, I wanna be able to just click and drag and it's really annoying to do it at such really high values. So what I like to do instead is add in a math node, put this in here. So it's for a sprinkle, nope, yes, sprinkle density. And I'm gonna hit a multiply just like we did before, but for 10,000. <gasps> oh no. <laughs> I was supposed to, oh, okay, it didn't, it didn't crash it. All right, but it, it multiplied this value, which is 50,000 roughly by another 10,000, um, which, which is not good. I was supposed to first set this to 50 so that it wouldn't do an insanely high calculation. The reason it wasn't bananas over here was that density min was deleting most of them. So by the way, it doesn't actually delete it, it just hides it. So you don't wanna use, an in, basically you want to uh, set this to zero, get your, density max amount, like here, you wanna get this to something that is like reasonable, and then you use your uh, your distance min thing to get rid of the rest. So don't go like a crazy high amount, um, because you won't, it'll just slow down Blender. All right, so we are at around 30 minutes. Um, in the next part, we're gonna improve this even more by uh, creating random variations to our cylinders, making them look more realistic, and then assigning random colors to each of our individual sprinkles as well. Um, so that'll be kind of like a part two of this uh, sprinkles bit. So go ahead, uh, click the video on the middle of your screen right now, and I'll see you in the next part.